Modernism started in Iran in aftermath of Iran and Russia wars in the 19th century. Iran lost Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. As a result of the war, a huge cultural community collapsed that made Iranian intellectuals and thinkers and writers think about the causes of this defeat. <coughs> Iranians had won and lost so many wars in their history, but none of them influenced Iranian culture and mind more than this one. <coughs> the last one, uh, the last war was not lost because uh, due to the lack of numbers or patriotism, but to a huge technology and management superiority of the Russians. This defeat was interpreted as a systematic weakness in Iranian mentality and their approach to life and nature. As a reaction to this shock, a movement of self-criticizing and translations from European languages started. <coughs> Six years later, in the beginning of the 20th century, <coughs> This movement ended in Iranian constitution revolution. Right after the revolution, Iranians hired Morgan Schuster, who was born in Washington, <coughs> D.C., to be the treasurer general of Iran, to help to build the economy. This appointment was not, in, was not tolerated by the imperial powers of the time, Russia and British, British army. And Morgan Schuster left the job. 50 years later, in the 1950s, after World War II, the United States was seen as a power that could help Iranians to get out of the influence of Russia in North and Britain in South. Mohammad Mossadegh, the popular Iranian Prime Minister, found the US as a trustworthy power that would help Iranian economy to grow and be independent of the British Empire. His trust was paid back by a coup d'etat and the tyranny and repression of Shah for 25 years. Many thinkers, activists, and writers were tortured and sentenced to long-term prison. Now Iran's fragile democracy was once more swamped between a cold war between two imperial powers, but this time US and Russia, and not Britain and Russia. During the Cold War, the U.S. wanted to sound the Russians and hence made a belt of Middle Eastern countries connected to the European allies to be a safety wall for defending themselves. Any democratic movement in Iran would be suppressed hard by the king and would be ignored by the U.S. administration. The U.S. viewed the Russians as the existential threat and so Middle East was the fortification against them. It took 25 more years after the coup d'etat that another movement led to Iranian revolution in 1979. The U.S. administration let the king stay in U.S. In short time, a group of revolutionary students attacked the U.S. embassy in Tehran and took the Americans as hostages. Eight years of Iranian and Iraq war and the Iranian commercial flight 655 that was shot down by the U.S. Navy in Persian Gulf added more to the traumatic relations of the two countries. And now all of us <coughs> in this room have inherited these historical traumas. Uh, during Obama's presidency, after 35 years, and for the first time both sides could sit face to face and discuss their interests, but now the fear is in the air again. Will the dialogue go on or not? We have Professor uh, Beeman here to discuss, I think, some of these aspects or maybe other parts of it, and the history of misunderstanding between the two countries. Professor Beeman uh, is a professor and chair of the Department of Anthropology at the University of Minnesota. He's former president of the Middle East section of the American Anthropological mm -hmm. Association and former director of Middle East Studies at Brown University. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
thank you so much. برای ایرانی ها که اینجا هستن یه خیلی مچکر هستیم دیگه که شما تشریف آوردید دیگه برای امشب ولی به انگلیسی صحبت میکنم چون هم فارسی نمیدونن I'm going to speak in English because not everyone knows Persian uh, and so I'm uh, delighted to be here and thank you all very much for uh, thank you all very much for, for coming and I see some old friends and new friends as well well the, the, as you can see the title of my talk is a Persian title um, which is uh, uh, these, are, these are two words that are very hard to translate because but they have a great they have great meaning for Iranians and uh, when you're with somebody you're not interacting with them it's a way of uh, it's a me method of social control uh, is when you make up after having been uh, so uh, we uh, hope obviously that the United States and Iran we are, we are in a state of right now uh, but uh, we are a little better off than we were 10, uh, even 15 years ago, and we might be, might be inching a little bit toward Ashti. We'll see. Uh, I want to rem remind everybody that when we talk about um, uh, Iran or Iranian um, uh, characteristics, we're, we are not trying to make an essentialist argument about some kind of Iranian mind uh, there was a terrible book by Raphael Patai called The Arab Mind, uh, which uh, is a shameful book, and I'm sorry that an academic wrote it. Uh, but the, uh, so but, uh, so we, I want to be quite clear with you that we're not talking about that. Uh, there's also no real American mind, there are, but there are ways that, uh, that humans uh, interaction, uh, interact with each other. And there are ways, there are cultural uh, systems and uh, structures whereby people actually uh, convey their emotions and their feelings and their desires to each other. And these patterns, uh, when viewed from the outside, can often look like a psychological characteristic rather than a communicational characteristic, which is really what they are. So uh, it's very important for Americans uh, to, understand the, uh, to understand American culture and what some of the differences are between American culture and patterns of, uh, uh, of communication if they want to try to communicate well with Iranians and vice versa. Uh, I will tell you that I think that, uh, that many of the many Iranian officials are actually a whole lot better at understanding American culture than Americans in understanding Iranian culture, no question. So let's look at these interaction patterns and some contrasts between them. Uh, one of the things that's very important about Iranian society is that it is hierarchical. Iranians recognize and, uh, and uh, adhere to, uh, to very clear patterns of hierarchy when they're interacting with each other. Uh, even two siblings, one of whom is older than the other sibling, uh, will have uh, a certain amount of respect from, or should have a certain amount of respect from the younger sibling. And if the younger sibling doesn't respect his older sibling or her older sibling, uh, then they will be, that will be the subject of maybe some discussion and some argument. Uh, and certainly older uh, people are um, more respected uh, than, uh, than younger people, even if they aren't very admirable. They, their age alone is enough to get them some respect. Uh, and if you're in a, a, a political hierarchy, even if the person in the, in the, who is uh, higher in the political or the social hierarchy is not a very nice person or is not very admirable, they still will have a certain amount of outward respect due to them, which, is respond which uh, uh, will be uh, important. Now, one of the ways that you can deal with a person who's not very admirable, who's misbehaving, is that you can bring them down. <laughs> and uh, if you do that, then of course they're no longer high anymore. Uh, so it's a, there's a, there are ways of dealing with uh, problems of, uh, uh, problems of uh, uh, people in, in a hierarchy who are misbehaving or who are not very admirable. Uh, but the hierarchy still stands, and that's one of the important lessons actually of anthropology, and that is that even though we may have exceptions to rules, the rules still stand, and that's really one of the important things. Now, in the United States, we suppress hierarchy. Now, hierarchy exists in the United States, but in the U.S., we don't like to talk about it. Uh, we are, if you'd go to a, uh, a business concern or a company or even here in the university, you'll see that 
everybody is just the same. We all go out drinking together, and we all call each other by our first name, and, and everybody's a friend, and everybody's nice, especially in Minnesota. Uh, uh, and so, but if you actually go to the, the company, uh, go to a company or to a political uh, uh, situation, you find that um, you find that there's a, there are very clear lines of hierarchy. It's just that we don't like to talk about it, and we try very hard to suppress uh, hierarchy. We like to be even uh, in our, our society, even if the higher, even if the suppression of hierarchy, the evenness is a, a fiction, a lie. So um, the in, in Iran, we, there's a very clear, also a very clear distinction between intimate spheres. That is things that are uh, that are very close and uh, and intimate uh, and public spheres. You don't behave the same way in private as you do in public. Actually, that's true. Uh, that's true. Uh, also, uh, any anywhere in the world, you're not the same with your family as you are with the outside world. Uh, but in Iran, it's very severely marked. Um, with uh, in uh, linguistic terms, there are linguistic forms that have to do with this. I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, and the uh, and there's a, a very clear distinction in Iran between the value of the inside and the uh, and the as being something that's very important and very spiritual and something that everybody aspires to try to achieve, as opposed to the outside, which is superficial and uh, and uh, has to be dealt with, but on the other hand, it's not uh, very admirable. Uh, so this distinction, this inside-outside distinction, is very important. I'll talk to this about in a minute. In the United States, we we tend to conflate uh, intimate and public spheres. We used to have a much better separation, or a much more pronounced separation between public and private. But now, you go to the opera, and you're going to go in jeans, maybe even shorts. I've seen people in in shorts and t-shirts at funerals, uh, and uh, the uh, it is. Uh, uh, and people don't modify their language very much in public situations as opposed to in private situations. So again, just like we try to suppress hierarchy, we suppress the difference between inside and outside in a very important way. So in, uh, in Iran, personalism in business affairs, that is making use of your family structures uh, in business affairs, uh, is, um, uh, is considered the normal way that people do their, their work. Uh, this is you. Why would you? Why would you want to not have personal connections or family connections in order to do your work? And in the United States, we uh, deny personalism to the point of making it illegal. And I think I, I think it's important for you to note that right now people are very, very, very upset about President Trump and the fact that he rely, he's relying so heavily on his family and on his personal connections that we don't like it. We think it's we think it's somehow wrong, uh, and the uh, I'm not defending it at all. By the way, uh, I think that it's uh, that it actually uh, the term nepotism uh, in the United States it used to be a crime. It used to be a crime actually here in the university. If you were a university professor, uh, the university wouldn't hire your spouse or your uh, or your your children. It was considered to be nepotistic. Um, so this is a these are very these are very, very important uh, differences. And uh, we, when uh, people in the United States who, who know something about the Iranian political system um, uh, point out that everybody in the power structures of Iran is related uh, by marriage or some other way, they, they say it in a very kind of nasty way. They say, you know, they're all related. Uh, and, uh, and for an Iranian, they say, yeah, well, yeah, of course. I mean, yes. Why? What? 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 Why? Why would you? Why would you find that odd? <laughs> uh, because that's the way that uh, that's that's one of the characteristics of Iranian society, where this is a a normal um, a normal way of doing things. So uh, when uh, we have um, uh, Iranian patterns of interaction, they're very complex. They're very intricate, and this is the uh, and I'll go back over these two things. First is the is the hierarchical distinction. The second is the distinction between inside and outside, and I'll talk about that quite a lot in uh, the course of the evening. So, in, in these relationships, in hierarchy, 
one might think, when we talk about hierarchy in the United States, we talk about people who are powerful and who do bad things to people who are underneath them. But in, in, uh, what one doesn't understand is that in the Iranian hierarchical system, it is symbiotic. You have to, you, you, if you're a, a subordinate, uh, you're, you're, if you're a superordinate or a person who's higher in the power structure, you have to, you can give orders, but you also have to dispense favors. If you don't, you're going to be in trouble. And the subordinates can make requests, but they have to also give service and tribute uh, to the people who are above them. And the, so this relationship is interdependent. And if, you, uh, if either uh, party breaks the, uh, this interdependent loop between uh, subordinate and superordinate, the system falls apart. So if you're a, a manager, uh, for instance, in a company, and if you fail to uh, pay good attention to your employees, you fail to care for them, you fail to show them the respect, even though you're superior and you can give orders, they will undermine you. They'll do all kinds of things to make sure that you, are, that you fail in your job. And they'll do it in secret. So you won't even know, the, 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 the manager may not even know uh, that that's happening. Uh, they'll lose things, uh, they'll, uh, they'll you know, uh, send things to the wrong place, uh, they'll uh, tell people gossip, uh, and uh, in the end, this, uh, the person who's in the higher position is going to fall. Uh, and they may not even know why. Uh, but, it, but all of this has happened. If, in fact, a person below who is doing things like you know, losing files and, and undermining the work of the office is confronted by the superior person, then the person, the, the person in the lower status can claim their lower status as an excuse. So the person comes to them and they say, why are you, why did you do this? Why did you ruin this, you know, this, uh, this operation? And the person says, it's because I'm so stupid and you're so smart. <laughs> and so how can I be, how can I ever rise to your greatness? How can I ever rise to be as wise as you? You, you have to teach me, you have to tell me how to do it because I could never, ever, ever know all the things that you know. And so, at the same time, they're undermining him, you know. They're really, they're doing all kinds of things that would, that would cause the person to fall. Uh, so, um, this, is a, uh, this, is a, a, this is normal in every uh, situation, and that is why, if you are in a superior position, you have to watch your back. Because, it, because people don't stay in these high positions for very long, if they don't, if they don't take care of people. Uh, and so the, it, it, it nice to be in, it's nice to be a superior person, but it is a great deal of responsibility. The same in the family, by the way. Uh, you know that you'll, um, you'll have a, a, uh, the head of the family, and the head of the family is expected to care for everybody in the family. And if they don't, then uh, uh, bad things will happen to them. Uh, I, some of you may know of the most wonderful novel ever written in Iran, as far as I'm concerned, and you probably know what I'm talking about. It's Dai John Napoleon, uh, my uncle Napoleon. If you haven't read it, uh, in, it's in a very excellent translation by Dick Davis. I, uh, uh, it, I, if you, haven't, uh, if you, uh, you can get a hold of it, I promise you, you will, uh, you will love the novel. It is so funny. Uh, and it talks all about a, a, a family who's a, where the head of the family is a rather silly man uh, uh, who tries to dictate things to the family, and then they're always doing things to make him, uh, to uh, embarrass him and make him unhappy. Uh, and uh, this is a, a really, really excellent novel, but it, it's a, a, a snapshot of, a, uh, of an Iranian family structure. So it, as a, I'm a linguist, so you know I have to do some linguistic things. <laughs> and this is, if you see the, the, the person of high status over here, is receiving, whoops, uh, is receiving tribute, service, and petitions for, from a person who's in the low status here. And the person in the low status is receiving rewards, receiving favors, and receiving orders. Now, the content may be exactly the same. Tribute is the, can be exactly the same as a reward. It can be the same amount of money, the same kind of thing. It's just how it's labeled that's important. 
whether you're being rewarded or whether you're being uh, whether you're giving tribute. So uh, material action and requests are the ways that this hierarchical structure is established. Uh, and there's another another interesting situation, and that is that people who are in a high status position don't move as much. Um, you will. If you go to a traditional Iranian uh, home, uh, and if you're uh, and if you're a guest for dinner, you you'll walk in the door, and the you'll find that the highest status person is the person who's farthest from the door. And so the, the because the, if you're farthest from the door, then people bring things to you, and the the people who are closest to the door are usually the kids. And the kids are always being sent out to get tea or to get sweets or to get this, that, or the other. Because they're the ones who move, and the high status people don't move. Uh, and if you if you if you're in a, a big party with uh, with a number of people, of course, what you do in order to show modesty and everything else is that somebody will usher you into the room and they'll say, "Please sit at the head." And of course, you don't do that. <laughs> what you do is you'll sit someplace closer to the door. And then the person will say, no, 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 please sit to the head. And you'll scooch a little bit. And then somebody else comes in who's higher status than you, and then they'll take a place further, further from the door than you. Eventually, everybody gets sorted out. Everybody gets to the, to the right place uh, in, the, uh, in the hierarchy. Uh, and uh, in this way, uh, every, the hierarchy is, is, uh, is realized. Everybody's comfortable. Everybody knows who's in the right place. Uh, and it's one of the big jokes, you know, that the Iranian kid comes back from uh, from being uh, from studying at the University of Minnesota, uh, and sits down at his uncle's house in a traditional house, and his uncle says, "Oh, you're the you're just come from abroad. You have to be the the, the uh, you have to be the honored guest here." And he's younger than everybody, so he says, "So you know, please sit at the head." And after ten years here studying engineering. He doesn't. Uh, he, he may have lost his sensibility about Iranian culture, and so he'll march right to the head of the table, and everybody will go. <laughs> They'll be shocked. So just remember, guys, uh, those of you who are, have been away for a while, remember when somebody says "befarmay bala," they don't really mean it. <laughs> okay. So here are American interaction patterns. Hierarchy I mentioned is suppressed. And independence is exercised. Independent choice is valued. Uh, and in, a, uh, in a, a, a structured hierarchical situation like in Iran, uh, independence is not as valued. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't have independent ideas or, or that they're ambitious. They're very ambitious uh, because uh, hierarchies are flexible. So you can move up in the hierarchy, and there are lots and lots of ways to do that. So, uh, but you have to figure out a way to work your way through the system. In the U.S., everybody only has a first name. You, how many people have you known where you, uh, you knew them, you've known them for a year, you've known them for two years, and you never, never knew their last name? All you knew is that, you know, it was John or Mary. Uh, and you have to ask your friends, I wanted to send something to Mary, and I just don't know her last name, and, I, and I'm really embarrassed now to ask, right? So you have to sneak around and find out. <laughs> what the person's last name is very funny. Um, uh, it's shameful to be dependent on anybody else. We we see this in our politics. Uh, we have people who who say that they hate you, the government because the government makes you dependent on them, uh, and they and so you know so therefore there are people who I, I remember seeing in uh, during the. Uh, the, the Bush administration, we had some interviews with some folks in outstate Minnesota who said, I'm proud of the fact that I never take any government assistance. And then you find out that they had a small business loan, their mother's on Medicare, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're all these things that, that, they, that they in fact get from the government, but they, they insist that they're independent and they're not being, they're not beholden to anybody and especially not beholden to that government that's acting as a, in a paternalistic fashion. That's what we're. That's what the healthcare debate is about right now. Uh, it's about independent choice and not being dictated to by a paternalistic Washington. Uh, and that's very characteristic of an American attitude. Uh, even though, as I point out to you, it's a bit of a fiction. Um, but nevertheless, the ideology is really there. So after an argument, though, this is interesting. Uh, everyone is supposed to forgive and forget and start again from zero. Now that doesn't mean they actually do it. 
but you're supposed to. Uh, so the, when you, you're supposed to just get over it, just put it behind you. Don't, you know, don't carry grudges. Don't, uh, you know, as, I, as I say, people may for years and years and years. As you can see this in divorce cases where you know, 30 years after a divorce, the, the, uh, the spouses will never get together in the same room, even when their mother dies or when the, uh, they, 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 they won't attend the funeral together because they're so angry. But if you ask the advice column people what you should be doing, I, my, my ex-husband's mother died and I really liked her and I really loved her and, and I kept up, uh, kept up with her, but I know that my ex-husband will be at the funeral, so I'm not, I just can't bring myself to be in the same room with him. So the advice columnist will say, just get over it. <laughs> you can spend an hour in the funeral parlor and smile and be pleasant and it won't kill you. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is something that uh, for, the, for the United States is very common. Children assert their independence very early. You have kids that are, uh, kids that are already being asked to make you know, very, very specific choices at a very early age and not be dependent on their parents' ideas. Uh, and uh, parents may have ideas about what their kids should or shouldn't be doing, uh, but by the time they're teenagers or in college, they're expected to be, ex uh, to be exercising independent choice. And uh, in the U.S., the uh, wives and, and husbands are supposed to complement each other, both complement each other and complement each other, uh, so that they function as a dyadic team, which is uh, very important. Uh, the, uh, the nuclear family in the United States is extremely important, and it takes precedent over the extended family. So that I remember, a, again, I love advice columns because they tell you so much about American culture. Uh, so this woman uh, says that she's been married, I've been married to my husband for 20 years, and I found out just the other day that every day since we were married, when my husband goes to work, he stops off for 10 minutes to see his mother on the way to work and have a cup of coffee with her. And she said, I feel betrayed. I feel like I should divorce him because he's not been loyal to me. <laughs> he's been... You know, and they, that's, that's, you can't deny her feelings, uh, but on the other hand, it shows you how, uh, how, uh, how very, very important the dyadic pair of the husband and wife are in American society, and how very strange that is in many other societies where you spread out your emotional life into your cousins and your aunts and your uncles, and everyone is, uh, everyone is very um, uh, interdependent in a, in a broad sense. Nevertheless, there, are def there definitely is hierarchy in the United States. So we have titles. Uh, you look at a press conference, you get the highest uh, title that we can bestow in the United States, and it's a double title. So in a, in a press conference, the, the, uh, the, the uh, person in the press, the uh, journalist says, Mr. President, Mr. President, and the president says, yes, John, and addresses him by his first name, uh, which shows you an, in, an unequal uh, situation, an unequal relationship. Um, and that Mr. President doesn't even get his family name or his first name. Um, so if, um, if a, a journalist uh, were to, even in the present situation, if the journalist were to go to a presidential press conference and say, uh, say, Donald, no, that wouldn't work. It would be, he might be thrown out of the room. He would certainly get on TV that night. <laughs> <laughs> no question about that. Even though, uh, even though in, the, in the company, you call the company president by their first name, right? So um, uh, there are lots of, there's a, we, we, we've studied, by the way, these address terms in English a lot. And there's, there's a, there's, it's a much more structured um, uh, situation than, than you, could, you would imagine. But it goes all the way from double title down to nickname. So if you can imagine the, 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 the press conference where the, pre, the journalist says, Mr. President, and the president says, yes, Stinky. Well, maybe Stinky was his name when he was in elementary school. Uh, but uh, you would not never do that. Uh, that's, that's, that's too far. So uh, Americans defer to power, but they don't call attention to it, which is uh, a very important uh, aspect of it. And the idea that everybody has an equal chance in life is, uh, is almost a religious belief in the United States. Uh, every, every child can rise to be president. We have lots of examples where people do 
uh, rise and do have an equal chance. So there's, this is a self-reinforcing uh, belief. Uh, but if you take a look at the, if you take a look at our current social situation, there are people who are disadvantaged practically from birth uh, because of their economic status or because of their uh, ethnic minority status. Uh, and they, uh, so it, it just simply is, in, objectively, simply not true that everyone has uh, an equal chance. But because this is a, a very, very, uh, a very important um, uh, fundamental kind of belief in the U.S., then uh, when somebody doesn't uh, rise or doesn't uh, succeed, then they're blamed because everybody has an equal chance. So the, uh, we, we had a congressman who said, if you're 30 years old and you are still receiving minimum wage, you are a failure in life, and it's your fault. So this thing cuts both ways. You can both, uh, we can both admire people who rise in the, in the hierarchy, but we can also slam people who don't rise in the hierarchy because everybody has equal opportunity. And if you just tried hard enough, then you could succeed. But obviously, if you're making minimum wage at 30, you just didn't try hard enough. You didn't have enough ambition. You didn't have enough skill. You didn't reg regulate your life correctly. So forgive and forget works in the United States, but both sides have to do it. So you have to, um, uh, you have to accept apologies. If you don't accept an apology, actually, that's kind of, uh, that's kind of thought to be not a very good um, way to behave. Uh, and people will urge you to do that. So both nations, both the United States and Iran, believe they should be respected. This is probably a human trait. Uh, but Iran expects an Iranian pattern, and the United States expects an American pattern when, we, when we're dealing with respect. So the, if, if, the, uh, if Iran had its way, uh, the United States would first of all express admiration for Iranian culture and civilization. Uh, and that would be a very, very important thing. Uh, and some, some of our elected officials have gotten that message because they've been told a thousand times uh, that if, you are, if you're going to criticize Iran or do anything, at the very least, you're supposed to say at the very beginning of your, uh, of your you know, statement, Iran has a great and ancient civilization that has, that has enriched the world with its, uh, with its uh, poetry and its art and its beautiful things. Uh, but a lot of people don't say that. So we've had politicians, especially during the Bush era, who start out by, start out by saying, Iran is an outlaw nation that, that spreads terrorism throughout the world. That's the first thing out of their mouth. And of course, uh, this is not what Iranians want to hear. So the uh, Iranian um, expectation, that's one of the Iranian expectation, is that, you know, that the, the great and wonderful things about Iranian civilization should be recognized. Uh, the United States uh, should uh, help Iran achieve its economic and cultural goals. Now, this is a, an interesting question because the question is, uh, from what position should the United States help Iran? Is it going to be a position of superiority? Or is it going to be a position of equality? Or a position of inferiority? Uh, or a position of cooperation? And the problem with the the equality position in, uh, for, from an Iranian standpoint is that it's very, very unstable. Uh, better, the hierarchical position is more stable. Uh, so uh, uh, expect, expecting the United States to be an equal partner uh, creates um, some uh, cognitive dissonance. The, uh, the Iran would like the United States also to remember the past, to remember and acknowledge the past. And you remember back here, Whoops. Forgive and forget. That's what, the, that's what Americans believe. Get over it. Stop thinking about these things. So if you, uh, so if you, uh, when you, uh, whoops. So the idea that you should remember the past and, and, uh, and acknowledge it is something that many Americans are extremely impatient with. You, they, uh, I've heard this from officials that I've talked with. They, uh, we, because we, we all know that in, uh, in 1952, the United States and, the, and Great Britain staged a coup which toppled Mossadegh. And I heard Americans say, that was 60 years ago. Why in the hell are the Iranians still bringing up the damn Mossadegh thing? They said, it, that it's, they should just get over it. 
<laughs> and that's a that's a, a very common that's a very common attitude. But of course, uh, Iranians do not forget. And the American history is 250 years old. Iranian history is 2,500 years old. There are people in Iran who will tell you that they hate Arabs. And uh, you say, why? And they say, because they conquered the Sasanians <laughs> in the seventh century. <laughs> and uh, uh, as an American, I mean, I'm, I'm amused, of course, uh, when I hear this. But they're, de they're deadly serious. They're really sincere. Uh, when they when they make a statement like that, so if we if people are still blaming the Arabs for the Islamic conquest in the in the seventh century, you think they're going to forget about Mossadegh sixty years ago? No, <laughs> of course not. Uh, and <laughs> this is uh, so it, it's a matter of a matter of knowing you know how people are, are structuring the world and considering the way that they're thinking about it. Now, the United States should, uh, if the United States claims superiority, then of course it should do nothing to, to harm Iran. And the United States has done lots and lots of things to harm Iran. We can, uh, one can, uh, not, not just starting with Mossadegh, but uh, also way, way back when many Iranians considered the United States to essentially be the inheritor of Great Britain. And from the 19th century onward, Great Britain and Russia, as we, uh, as Mossadegh pointed out, that the, uh, the uh, 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 Iran has been greatly harmed by outside forces, and the U.S. is considered by many people to be the inheritor of Great Britain. Of course, there are still many Iranians who think that the British are still doing this, that anything that the United States does is still the fault of the British. Back to Dai John Napoleon, back to my uncle Napoleon, who blamed the British for everything. His maid gets pregnant, it's the British's fault. It's the, his garden gets ruined, it's the British plot. And so. Uh, that's why he's called Uncle Napoleon, uh, because he blames the British for everything in his life. Uh, so you, you want, but you want Iran to be treated with the respect that is accorded other nations. And the whole, uh, um, about 90% of, uh, of the nuclear problem that we had with Iran uh, had nothing to do really with Iran uh, having a nuclear weapons program, because Iran didn't have a nuclear weapons program doesn't and will not. But, the, but what the United States was trying to do was to deprive Iran of the rights for uh, nuclear development that, uh, that every other nation who had signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which Iran did and the United States did, uh, had enjoyed. Iran was being singled out for, um, for uh, uh, discrimination under that. So, but the United States has its own set of desires uh, with regard to Iran based on our patterns. So first of all, the United, Iran would be friendly and say nice things about the United States. And every time something happens, you'll, you'll get comments in the paper that says, how can we trust a nation that says death to America? They're, they're saying death to America is, sh shows you that we can't trust the Iranians. OK. <laughs> Little, you know, I've, 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 gone, I've gone blue in the face telling people that these, you know, that these protestations where you know, they haul out signs that are, that are sort of death to America, these are political protests where people who come are given a sandwich and a, and a, a bottle of, of pop, and, uh, they're, and, and they're you know, very happy to scream death to America for 10 minutes. Uh, and, uh, uh, then at the same time we turn around in the in the U.S. and we say, uh, we say, but our political rallies they're genuine. Oh yeah, these are people who are really genuinely feeling what they uh, what they think. They don't understand that any political rally has to be organized, uh, and it has to be organized by people who have an uh, an, an issue. So by the way, the, the Death to America rallies have stopped pretty much. Uh, so, uh, but we don't, we don't like people saying bad things about us. That's not nice. And so, uh, the, uh, so uh, when Iran says these things, Iran and the United States get very unhappy. Uh, they, we want, the United States wants, the, wants Iran to say, to be very grateful and to say thank you for all the good things that the United States has done, especially during the period of the Shah, uh, because we helped Iran to become industrialized. By the way, we also helped Iran to develop its nuclear program. <laughs> and the <laughs> starting in 
actually in the Eisenhower administration. Uh, and um, uh, so when, whenever the United States does something uh, that they consider to be nice to Iran, like, for instance, talking to Iran's foreign minister, then the Iranians are supposed to be very, very grateful for the extraordinary favor that the United States has conferred on them by deigning to talk to one of their officials. So, um, and I, again, I've heard this from Washington. They said, well, we, we sat down and talked to them, and they aren't grateful. <laughs> and so it is a, 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 very, a, a very strange kind of dynamic. And of course, forgive and forget. They just forget that old Mossadegh thing and, and, and that Iraq, that Iran-Iraq war, you know, where, you know, we were, that where the United States was helping the Iraqis. I mean, that was another president. It was another time, another set of circumstances. Uh, it was during the Cold War, uh, you know, they, so they, you, they, they should just forget uh, what was going on. They should defer to the suggestions of the United States, like um, whatever, you know, you want to think about that the United States might, uh, might suggest to them, like, uh, stop supporting Hezbollah. They should just do that because the United States said so. Uh, they should stop supporting Assad. Never mind that Iran has a... a standing internationally recognized mutual defense treaty with Syria. Never mind, just stop, just stop right now, because we said so. Uh, and that's a, so that's a, a problem. And you don't want them to hurt any, to do anything to hurt the United States or its friends. And when we are accusing Iran of things in the United States, we try to, we go out of our way to try to find ways that Iran has actually hurt the United States. In fact, the United, the, Iran has not hurt the United States at all. Uh, and the, in, in fact, it hasn't even really hurt Israel, uh, it, which, is, which we consider to be our friend. But the construction in the, uh, in the United States is that the United States, that, that Iran is in fact hurting the U.S. And there are many, many strange constructions uh, of, uh, the, the, of current history that show that. When most of all, the United States would like Iran to be like the United States. They'd like to, they'd like to uh, see more democratic institutions in, uh, in Iran. Uh, the current uh, election was uh, really very interesting because, uh, because of, of course, it was a real election, and I'll get to that in just a minute. It was a real election that had, uh, that had uh, real campaigning, and, uh, the, uh, and uh, President Rouhani was reelected with a, an enormous margin of, of victory. Uh, and uh, when you talk to Americans about this, you said there was a real election. And they said, yeah, but, you know, the candidates were all pre-selected by that Council of Guardians, so it wasn't democratic. And so I said, well, all right, um, what would you say if there was a system where you didn't even vote for people, all you did was vote for a party, for a political party, and, and then the party chooses who's going to be the, you know, the leader of the country? Nine times out of ten, people say, well, that wouldn't be democratic. That would be communism. And you say, well, you know, um, that, that's kind of how they do it in Spain, and that's kind of how they do it in Israel. You know, do you think that, do you think that Netanyahu was directly elected? You know, they, it's kind of how they do it in England. Uh, that's, how, that's how democracies are structured in most of the world. Uh, and the, so the idea that you, that you have some kind of mechanism for pre-selection is thought by, you, by people in the United States to be uh, a, a terrible thing. But in this last election in Iran, almost 1,200 people presented themselves for the presidency, as candidates for the presidency. Almost 1,200. Uh, and the, uh, maybe it was even more than 1,200 anyway, it, it was uh, in uh, 2005, there were only 400 people that, that presented themselves. 1,200 people. So there has to be some way to sort this field out. And because Iran doesn't have conventional political parties, uh, the, the, you can't use the party system in order to do it. There has to be some way to do it. Uh, and in the Iranian constitution, it's the, it's the Council of Guardians. And I don't think it's necessarily the best way to do things. But on the other hand, it is a way that has resulted in stable elections since the time of the revolution. We've never had a coup d'etat, and nobody has overstayed their two-term limit uh, as, uh, as president, as they are doing in Turkey, and as we, did have, as we had in Egypt, and of course in Saudi Arabia, where nobody's elected at all. They just are kings and, and princes. Uh, so the, uh, we, we give the Saudis a pass. We kind of don't like Erdogan in Turkey, and 
we sort of uh, we, we we kind of give Mubarak in, uh, and 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 Al Sisi in, in Egypt a kind of a pass. Uh, but then when we have the Council of Guardians selecting six candidates for a presidential election in Iran, that's bad. That's not democratic. Uh, so it is a um, a, a very uh, interesting exercise in kind of uh, uh, of uh, holding Iran to a standard of egalitarianism that we don't really hold uh, other countries to. Um, now, the uh, uh, United States would like uh, it, uh, Iran to uh, be sensitive to U.S. values about the equality of minority populations and women, except that Iran is pretty good at this. <laughs> Iran's, uh, Iran uh, treats its minority populations with one exception, and that is the Baha'i in Iran, who are have been persecuted in Iran since the 19th century uh, as a, a um, considered to be a heretical uh, sect. The, with that, without that one exception, Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, uh, other uh, religious minorities are, uh, are treated extremely well. And as I think many of you know, the role of women in Iran has, uh, has, has very steadily improved uh, since the, the time of the revolution to the point where majority of university students are women, and that is even in fields like engineering and medicine. So you know, the, uh, uh, but if you, I've had, I've had people tell me uh, that uh, when I say that uh, the situation for women in Iran is improving, I've had people say, but they don't even let them drive. Okay, so there's a lot of ignorance out there. That, you know, I, I gently say, no, that's not Iran, that's Saudi Arabia. <laughs> And we have women truck drivers in Iran. We have women cab, and cab drivers in Iran. No, it's not. The Iranians do let women drive. And they say, they get, they get very confused because uh, they, they lump everybody together in one thing. So, qahr. Do you, in, when you're qahr, you, uh, you draw interaction, uh, to withdraw interaction from an intimate. And it can't be remedied by the two individuals. The two qahr individuals can't solve their problem. You have to be sol it has to be solved by the community. So if you have two uh, people who are estranged from each other, the, their, their broader community, their family or their friends, have to intervene in order to bring them back together. And because they're, they're, there's a, a bit of honor that's involved here, uh, so you, uh, you, so you need these, uh, the, the community to force them back together, to force them into reconciliation. That way they're not making the reconciliation on their own. And of course, this is uh, the term, the qahr state can be used strategically uh, to make somebody relent on some issue. So I remember uh, a, a couple of my acquaintance uh, asking them, asking the wife, I said, what, how do you, you're, you know, your husband's a very strong-willed person, so how do you control him? She says, ah, I just, wait, I, 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 stopped being, I stopped interacting with him. And then after a little while, he understands that he's done something wrong, but he won't say anything. So then I get the kids, and I, the kids make us make up. Um, and <laughs> so uh, this, is a, this is a way that this can do. So the United States uh, and, and Iran became ah, at the time of the Iranian Revolution because both nations violated the expectations of the other, and this situation has never, never been healed. Um, and we still don't have diplomatic relations with Iran. The only other nation with whom we don't have di diplomatic relations is North Korea. Now that we have diplomatic relations with Cuba, it makes really almost no sense for us not to have diplomatic relations with Iran, but we, we still don't. So what do you do while you're waiting for Ashti? First of all, you fight with each other. Uh, you recruit allies, you get people uh, on one side or the other to be your uh, spokesperson. That's what we're doing right now in the United States, or at least we don't know that we're doing this actually, but we are. That is, you go to Saudi Arabia and you say, let's fight Iran. Uh, and uh, the, uh, and the, the Saudis say, sure, they, that's, uh, that's fine. So you're recruiting uh, allies like uh, Saudi Arabia, but at the same time you stay in contact. That's the curious thing. When you're there with somebody, you don't break contact. You just don't talk, uh, or you don't interact with, with each other. You, but you still are in contact with each other. You might, uh, you might send little messages through other people. You might, um, you might leave things around the house that, uh, that remind the other person that you're there. Or, uh, but there, there are all kinds of ways to, to do that. 
Uh, those of you who are married, you've never, I'm sure, never heard about this. Uh, then, the, uh, then you get the other person's attention by annoying them or attacking the other party. And this is a, this is a, uh, a form of uh, behavior that we call as yet. Uh, so you're, you know, you're, uh, you're encouraging the other, you're getting the other person's goat uh, by, and reminding them that you're there. That's the thing. You don't break contact. And by bothering someone in these little ways, you're still maintaining a, a relationship. And you never concede until the community forces you to do it. So um, the Americans aren't good at this. We really don't. Because we think that the, in the end, the most powerful person is going to win. And the other person has to acquiesce. And it's not an idea where you have a, 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 an, an equal-sided estrangement. The American, uh, the American model is that you have two people who have a, uh, a disagreement, and then one person outspends or outpowers the other person, and then they capitulate. Uh, and even though we believe in egalitarianism, we're still quite happy to play a power card in, in doing this. So Iranians are very experienced at Qahar, and they can wait and wait and wait and wait until the, until the situation is resolved. And this has now gone on for us for more than almost 50 years uh, we, between the, Iran and the United States. And the Iranians are very patient. And the Americans are very frustrated. Uh, and uh, during the Ahmadinejad period in Iran, of course, he was engaging in all kinds of, uh, of uh, asiat, all kinds of, uh, of things to bother the United States and to, uh, to pique our uh, are uh, being upset and these death to America things. That's part of the, that was part of it all. Uh, so here's Asiat to bother or to annoy someone, and this is how someone who's in an inferior relationship uh, uh, is uh, all is um, uh, bothers the person who's in the superior relationship and signals to them that their uh, their uh, um, behavior is not pop, not proper. But it can also be used by people who are ah, with each other. And it isn't harmless. Uh, people can really do damage to each other uh, in, these, uh, in these situations. Uh, but uh, in a ah situation, you expect ashti eventually. And so you don't, you don't want to do anything that really destroys the, the relationship forever. So destroying, burying, misdirecting documents, spreading rumors, co-opting others, showing, uh, slowing up paperwork, permissions, all of these things are... Um, are things that can be done. So, but what is curious about the Iranian situation, and I mentioned this already, is that the interaction system favors the person in the lower position. The person can always claim weakness or inability or uh, in failing to fulfill their relationship. And so I call this getting the lower hand. Uh, so it is, a, it is actually a very good situation for you to be in. Uh, so and if you show humility, then the, uh, the person who is showing humility uh, can always claim to be blameless compared to the, the more erudite responsibility of the other person. So the person in the, in the superior position is actually weak, uh, and they have to be very careful about how they uh, exercise their power in order to keep from being uh, discredited. Uh, this, is actually, um, this is actually the, uh, uh, I think, one of the real virtues of Mr. Rouhani. He's been very, very good about maintaining a superior position uh, and, not, um, uh, and not aggravating people or, or uh, aggravating people beneath him. He's disappointed them uh, sometimes by not being able to do a lot of different things. But uh, again, he was, re he was reelected, so I, I think that somebody felt that he was still okay. So the, but people who, uh, who assert their status without support are in danger of being undermined by their subordinates. Uh, we, we would call this power mon mongering or qudrat talabi. This is a situation where you, you just simply assert that you, you're, that you're, you have superior uh, status and superior power without necessarily doing anything to justify it. And people hate that. And they'll, kill, they'll just knock you off the, the pedestal really fast uh, if you uh, get involved with a, a situation like that. So uh, it's severely disapproved. Now, the thing is that you know, when I'm talking, talking about hierarchy, 
there are people who are really superior. They are, they are, they've earned their superior status. Uh, and they are, um, these include poets, they're scholars, they're artists, they're Sufis, uh, they're scholars, they're philosophers, and also older relatives and teachers especially teachers, you know, <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and even people who, are, who have great uh, political power will subordinate themselves to such people because they have, they have cultural superiority and are, are, are truly revered and they, they deserve the respect that they get. I'm going to have to run, I've, I've been talking too much and I'm going to have to run through uh, some of this, these slides uh, and I'll do it very quickly because I do want to get to a few things uh, that are contrastive between uh, U.S. and Iranian positions with regard to some contemporary work. Um, for those of you, again, I'm a linguist, so you know I, I want to show you some. I always want to show you some things. Uh, in, in the in Persian, you have different uh, verbs and different pronouns that are used for to uh, refer to people who are superior to you or people who are inferior to you. Well, actually, you don't do that. You, you refer to yourself as being inferior. You refer to others as being superior. Do any of you know Japanese? Anybody know? Nobody knows Japanese. Japanese, the, the Japanese do this too. Um, so, and then the we have some amazing verbs that show also the um, um, the uh, relative stasis of people in high status positions. So, going, coming, and and existing, being, get all collapsed into a uh, into a single verb. So, um, I, as when you um, when you uh, came in today, I uh, I said to the, the Iranians that I uh, that uh, thank you for uh, for uh, for bringing your presence, Tashrif Awardan, here. Now, if I wanted to be really uh, fancy, I could have said Tashrif Farman Shodan. Tashrif So. Uh, and Saraf uh, Rosfarmudan, that was used during the time of the Shah, it means to command your head to be raised uh, in, uh, in the presence of somebody who's very great. And that can be substituted for any verb of movement. Uh, so I'm going to move uh, on to this. What is, what's interesting about this situation is that if you're praising someone, if you're using a high status uh, verb or pronoun towards somebody else and a low status verb toward yourself, you're automatically constructing a hierarchical situation, and the and but if both people do it, then it's stable. If you're if you're praising the other person and the other person is praising you, and you're lowering yourself and the other person is lowering themselves, then the position is stable, uh, because uh, everybody is maintaining the hierarchy, but at the same time, they're stabilizing their relationship with each other, and um, you will. Uh, you see this routinely in Persian. Persian's a fantastic language. Everybody should learn it. It's easy, uh, and uh, the, the uh, and it, it embodies all of these wonderful uh, social structures uh, in it. So the the uh, the most uh, kind of common uh, institutionalization of these relationships is uh, is tarof. Tarof is polite language and polite behavior that marks status relationships in Iran. And just as with language, you practice ta'rof, lowering yourself, raising the other person. And it's, it can be actually quite aggressive. Um, so uh, even in the post-revolutionary times, ta'rof is an ingrained behavior. Uh, and uh, I am, I'm astonished, 40 years after the revolution, to find it is still alive and well. It is still... Uh, practice here in the United States, and I tell you, some of you Iranian uh, students and Iranian Americans, I know that you practice it, uh, and in, uh, I know you practice it because you'll say routinely to your friends when you offer them something and they refuse, you'll say, don't talk. Please don't, you know, don't refuse. Um, so, um, I, I, the uh, uh, people will People actually will do favors for people in in secret, in order to show their to in order to raise the other person up, but at the same time show their superiority in being able to practice tarof. So um, there's a wonderful article called the the martial art of tarof, uh, and uh, this uh, was written in Los Angeles 
by some guys who are um, there. Uh, basically, they, um, they're, they go to a restaurant with their friend, and then a third person comes who knows them both, sits down, has a, uh, has a cup of tea while they're eating their, uh, their dinner, and then leaves a, uh, it's good because he says he has to do something. And come to find out that, uh, that uh, as he was leaving, he paid the bill for the other two people and left. Just left. And they got so mad <laughs> because how dare he? How dare he do that? Uh, and the uh, and uh, because he was showing, you know, respect for them, and then they in the end of the article they say, they say we will we will inflict such a kindness on you that you will never forget. <laughs> <laughs> so Taro is a, is a real a real thing. Um, uh, the uh, Zerangi is cleverness. This is a way to work the system. I'm not going to go into this, but it's the, the point is that it's devalued as a human experience. Everybody wants the ability to be Zerang, to be clever, to be uh, working in the, uh, in an, in the outside world, uh, and, but they, and they, they'll do this and they'll justify it by protecting their interests or the interests of their family or something of that sort, but at the same time they don't want to be known at, for this quality. They don't want to be known as a Zerang person, because Zerang belongs to the outside. It's not the inside. And, be, and it also implies insincerity. And there are, lots of, uh, there are lots of folks who seem to be very slimy. OK, I'm going to skip ahead quite a ways, um, but I want, I want you to know that the, 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 the difference between the Zahir and the Baten, between the outside and the inside, is very pronounced in Iran. And the outside is uh, the outside is the the uh, place of the world. Inside is the place of spirituality. And so, when you uh, when you're looking for sincerity or um, real meaning in life, you direct yourself toward the inside. Uh, and it is uh, uh, it's enormously spiritual and important. Um, the this is a a, a a slide from Iranian Tazia, Iranian. Uh, traditional drama that oftentimes centers on the martyrdom of Imam Hussein, who is probably the most baten person in the world, the most inside person in the world. He's the core of uh, has a core of spirituality aside from the Sufi poets. Um, and intimacy is uh, the life of uh, Iran is biased tremendously toward intimacy, uh, and you want that uh, as a spiritual goal. You, that's what gives meaning uh, to life. And so you find, you find intimacy in poetry, you find intim intimacy in philosophy, and in music. Uh, and although we may have people in the United States who believe that, you know, that poetry and literature and, and music and things of that sort are, uh, are spiritual and important, they don't even begin to uh, replicate the importance of these kinds of, uh, of methods of achieving intimate. Uh, spirituality uh, in in uh, in Iran. This is really important. Uh, and uh, if you, uh, I I've never, honestly, I've never hard, hardly ever found a, any Iranian person who didn't uh, could confess that they had written some poetry sometime. And of course, they all know it. Uh, so uh, all uh, most all Iranians know poetry. They have a volume of Hafez on their table and. Uh, uh, and it is a, a very, uh, a very important part of life. So the ability to live in the Baten, in the in the interior, spiritual interior, is extremely admired, and this is the characteristic that we uh, that we especially find for Sufi masters. Sufi masters are able to shut out the uh, the world and live entirely in a spiritual world, uh, and they they re they are greatly revered for their ability to do this. So um, lots and lots of about ten people. Um, okay, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to go forward. Uh, nafs is the, the kinds of things that you are, um, are trying to combat: greed and envy and uh, and um, 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 uh, sexuality and addiction and all of these things. Those are outside forces, and you can combat them by moving inside. Here's uh, Omar Khayyam. This is way way back in the 11th century, so. Guyan mara ke me parastam hastam. Guyan mara aref o mastam hastam. Dar zahiram negah besyari makum. 
Kandar Balten, Chanan Kahastan Hastan. Right? Uh, they say of me how wine's great friend I am, they say of me how wise and drunk I am. Don't look too much and too close at my external state. Internally, that which I am, I am. Okay, uh, no more, uh, no more uh, of this. <laughs> we'll get to the end here. I want to just show you some events and how they're constructed by the United States and by Iran. The Iranian Revolution was a, the, Iran saw the United States as breaching, uh, and, and the Shah as breaching hierarchical responsibilities. When the Shah started shooting people, that was the end. That was really the end. Uh, and I was there. Uh, and the American view is that America, the United States helped Iran to modernize and so they should be grateful. Uh, the Shah uh, abandoned the Iranian people when the army fired on protesters. And the, uh, the United States says, well, people choose their own rulers, you know, I mean, they, they, they chose the Shah. No, they didn't, but, uh, but, <laughs> they, uh, but you know, it's a, matter of the, it's a matter of the will of the people, you know, who they, who they actually get. Uh, and the United States was thought to have an entirely Zahir, entirely uh, materialistic or external motives. And the, uh, the, from the United States, everybody said, well, you know, you operate in your own best interests. And uh, if the, 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 the marketplace was alive and well in Iran, yeah, there was terrible inflation. and People got, uh, got rich selling land and, and stealing money and so forth. But it was the marketplace. And so therefore, we should revere and respect uh, the, uh, the marketplace and the ability of any, any person to get ahead. So in Iran, the, the, in the hostage crisis, which is the really the real start of our estrangement with Iran, Ayatollah Khomeini cemented his bona fides with his followers. And if he hadn't done that, he would, uh, he would have been undermined. New York Times recently printed an article that said that, uh, that Ayatollah Khomeini instigated the hostage crisis, just simply not true. Uh, he did, did, uh, already was started, he was in Qom, he didn't know it had happened. And it was only after the thing had started that he had to figure out a way to control it. Uh, but if he, had, uh, if he had thrown his supporters out during that very fragile period, uh, probably the revolution would have stopped. Uh, he outflanked these students uh, who, by expressing views that were even more extreme than they had, and gradually they swapped out the original um, occupiers of the American embassy. Uh, and uh, his, uh, his whole point uh, during that time was to try to try to solidify the country, try to create the country, uh, rather, rather than trying to uh, adhere to the United States uh, views. So Iran, from the American standpoint, Iran was an outlaw, you know, violating, violating standards of behavior. Uh, people should be willing to sacrifice themselves for people who have more power, namely for you know, the uh, Iranians should have just given up the hostages, no matter how much instability it would have created in their own country. And the, they ab abandoned possibility with friendship with the United States. So the hostage crisis was, was eventually re resolved. And what is, was interesting for me is that it was resolved according to Iranian cultural patterns. And for the Americans, and I even talk to them today, they somehow have this they somehow okay, they can't understand it. They, 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 somehow the Iranians, after a long period of time, mysteriously agreed to settle, and the United States doesn't exactly know why. Uh, first, for one thing, the hostage crisis had outlived its usefulness, uh, but it was a, it was a, a solution that was mediated by third parties. It took place in Algeria. There were other. There was another nation involved. We think it might be Germany, uh, and the uh, Algerians were a, a, an annoyance to the Americans. Uh, but they had to deal with it uh, because the Iranians insisted on it. So this is, a, this is the way that a Qahr state gets resolved. And that is that you have a, uh, an, an intermediary, a third party, that forces the two estranged parties together. And then in this case, this was a mediated solution through Algeria, and that's how it was happening. And uh, the Iran ben benefited very, very little from the resolution. Uh, it, um, and th in doing this, uh, there was a, an element of sacrifice for the Iranian people uh, that showed sincerity. And that's, uh, that's an important point in dealing with inside and outside. And for the United States um, uh, standpoint, Iran got, got away with it. They were never punished. They uh, were, 
they, they got some, you know, some released um, uh, assets. And the U.S. is the people. People in the United States are still angry about this. They think that Iran never, never, never was punished enough for the hostage crisis, and they'll tell you that. So the Iran-Iraq War. The United States uh, aided Iraq from the standpoint of Iran, demonstrating no connection with Iran or the Iranian people. And the United States uh, saw this as a way of preventing a political a, a spread of political ideology which was going to threaten uh, Israel and spread disorder. There was no expression of regret uh, for uh, inadvertent in, uh, injury to the Iranian people, as, for instance, the, the Iran Air Jet 626 that was shot down over the Persian Gulf, and for which George W. Bush blamed the Iranians in the United Nations. He said, they, he said yeah, the plane was shot down, but it's their fault because they were somewhere they shouldn't have been. And uh, that was really hard for the Iranian people to hear. And Iran, uh, the Americans think that, the, the, that Iran at that point deserved no consideration from the United States. So we have a state of Qar, and the United States continues to practice Qodrat Talabi, do what we say. Uh, and there are uh, the, um, that we, when we have some little teeny bits of uh, rapprochement, like requests for aid in Afghanistan or earthquake relief, then the United States immediately undercuts it by, for instance, we, uh, Iran had helped the uh, United States in their uh, uh, combating the Taliban in Afghanistan. And then immediately George Bush brings out the axis of evil speech, uh, right, on, right on the heels of that. And of course, the Iranians see this as a, an example of insincerity. Uh, and these visa problems are um, a huge sign of the United States' uh, unwillingness to improve relations. Uh, adding Iran to the list of, uh, of nations in the, the, in the Trump travel ban was utterly gratuitous. Iran has never done anything uh, to, um, uh, to harm the United States. No Iranian was involved in the 9-11 uh, uh, activities, uh, nothing. It was just that Iran was on uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the bad list. I was going to say something that began with an S, but it was, uh, Iran was on the bad list, and so it got you know, tacked on to all the other nations in the travel ban. You all, all, I think you all know that it was blocked by the courts again today, the second version of the travel, travel ban. Uh, the, um, the, um, uh, there were, um, the, the, we did silly things, like there was an Iranian... Um, uh, an Iranian um, uh, UN mission uh, guards, and they were taking tourist photos in Manhattan, and they were kicked out of the United States for I don't know what, you know, <laughs> spying because <laughs> they were taking pictures of the Statue of Liberty. I mean, really, quite quite ridiculous. Uh, and the 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 fact is that uh, Iran would like to we re would like to resume uh, relations with the United States, but the, right now we we just can't. To it, and certainly under the Trump administration, it's not going to happen. So um, the reform movement, very interesting. Reformers and conservatives are all related and inter interconnected, as we would imagine, and so there's a family affair going on. Uh, and uh, Khatami was abandoned by his supporters, despite the ideology of reform. And the same may be true of Rouhani, although this last election shows that he was, in fact, very, very popular. The U.S. position with regard to the Iranian nuclear power was one where the United States was very clearly trying to uh, accuse Iran of something that they weren't doing uh, and trying to restrict Iran's ability to do things like uh, enrich uranium, which they have every right to do under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and which 19 other nations do without having nuclear weapons, some of whom have had nuclear weapons programs in the past or have said that they will have them in the future, like Japan. So, uh, the, uh, uh, but as Iran has very studiously cultivated relations with other nations, India, China, Russia. And as long as these relations remain strong, uh, again, they can wait for a long time before the, in order to get the United States back on track. I'm coming to the end here. The Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the uh, so-called Iran deal. Uh, from Iran's standpoint, Iran had the right to nuclear technology through the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And the United States maintained, rather stupidly, 
that the that mere enrichment of uranium is proof of a nuclear weapons program. Again, ignoring those 19 other nations that do it, uh, and that uh, that, that uh, the United States has nothing to say about. Uh, Iran was willing to suspend um, uh, its much enrichment in order to return, in order to uh, lift sanctions. It was a transactional uh, a thing on Iran's part. And the United States uh, interpreted this as coercion. So Iran's willingness to suspend enrichment was interpreted by the United States as the result of, of the exercise of American power on Iran, which forced Iran to capitulate. That's how, the, that's how it was constructed in Washington. So this view is very, very different, as you can see. And Iran, uh, Iran, back in, Iran wonders you know, why, they, uh, why they gave up this thing, when the Americans then would go back and say, the reason that Iran gave up the enrichment was because Iran was weak, and we were strong, and we were able to make them do it. Uh, so this is a, a very, these are very, very different constructions of exactly the same event. So the, um, the Iranians believe that, it meant that uh, the United States should adhere to the agreement as a matter of principle. And the, uh, in, in the Trump administration, they're saying that the United States doesn't have to adhere to the agreement because Iran is just bad. And so therefore, if, you have, if Iran is bad, then the United States shouldn't have to adhere to the agreement, even though it's an agreement. And it's signed, and it's sealed, and there are five other nations that are involved. But, we, but, uh, but simply declaring Iran to be bad, for the, at least the Trump administration, is enough to, to eliminate the, uh, uh, the, uh, the agreement, which, they, by the way, they can't do. Structurally, they can't do it. So the, all, every, every time you, you hear about this, it's just smoke and mirrors. So the Iran presidential election, finally. Uh, the, uh, I, I interpret the re-election of Rouhani as support for internationalization, and social reform, uh, which is, uh, I think, the message that the Iranian population was trying to send uh, to the Iranian government. And Rouhani's election, I, you guys, uh, you, you folks may not understand, this was cataclysmic. This was an astonishing election. Uh, Rouhani not only won in Tehran, he won everywhere. He won in Mashhad. Which is the hometown of his uh, of his uh, opponent, Mr. Raisi, who practically owns the city of Mashhad, in uh, in uh, and he won in every population class and in every area of the country, rural, urban, everywhere, uh, and so this was a, a resounding mandate uh, on the part of the Iranian population, uh, and the uh, people in the United States are, I think, are really not cognizant of the of the really uh, astonishing victory that, uh, that took place in this, in this election. And you can, it, it's, uh, you know, it's anonymous, everybody votes anonymously, so you can't blame anybody, but uh, it was really important. And here's Elliot Abrahams, a former Bush administration uh, person who's, who really hates Iran. But he, he, I think that his view is very common, and that is, he, he said, I support Raisi because that is the true face of Iran with which we should be dealing. And this Rouhani fellow, he's just a, uh, he's just a wolf in sheep's clothing. And the more we have people like Ru like Rouhani, the the less we can really understand what the true violent nature of Iran is. Uh, and um, so we have a uh, we have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, discussion that we need to take that needs to take place between the United States and Iran if we're ever going to get to some kind of understanding about how these things are going on. And finally, the. Uh, their, their international relations, and Iran is, uh, is involved, in fact, with various aspects of the Shia world. The Shia minorities in Lebanon, Yemen, and previously in Iraq, and in Saudi Arabia, they have no protection, they're discriminated against, and they need support. That's the Iranian, review, uh, Iranian view. And the, the, the Trump administration has come out with this idea that, and this is Rex Tillerson, our new Secretary of State, that Iran is trying to spread he Shia hegemony in the world. Believe me, the Sunni Muslims are not going to convert to Shiism en masse. You can't, it, it, does, it will not happen. Uh, and the, the idea of some kind of Shia hegemony is a, a, some strange fantasy construction uh, that, uh, that has uh, come up in the political uh, rhetoric of Washington that I, 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 have no, I have no idea where it comes from. 
Well, I, I can guess. I mean, maybe from Benjamin Netanyahu. But the uh, but this is uh, uh, this shows you again the, the huge distance that we uh, that we have to get uh, to bridge before the Qah situation between Iran and the United States can be uh, can reach a state of Hashti. So that's it. Thank you. I'm sorry I went way over time, but I had so much fun uh, putting this together. I, I hope you find it interesting.